Good afternoon to everybody. Um, welcome to this session that is sponsored by Edwards Life Sciences, and the title is The New Pascal Precision System and Lasers, um, the Full Potential for Modular Transcatheter Edge-to-Edge -edge Repair. And we have um, the objective um, um, to make you kind of familiar with the Pascal system, and we will have the opportunity to see a, a recorded live case um, um, with Pascal Precision in action. We will discuss with you together um, the uh, implant selection and um, we will see some clinical data and published data and also clinically experienced data from um, very experienced um, um, physicians. A warm welcome also from my side. I'm your call center from Munich. Um, and we want to do a very interactive session today. So you have all your iPhones ready because you, we, are, we are requesting that you're going to ask questions. I will try to filter these questions and pull them up so that we can also work on these. Um, and we have for the discussion also a very esteemed panel, besides Sam Dawkins sitting here with us, we have um, um, Frederico De Marco, Rodrigo Estevez, Tobias Geisler, Fabian Pra, and also Maurice Taramasso sitting with us, and we will have a lot of discussions, hopefully, um, during this uh, next few minutes. Um, we're going to start with a poll. We want to ask you, and we can, can we have the poll um, up there? You see it on the right side. What is your level of confidence in achieving significant and sustained mitral regurgitation reduction with a Pascal repair system right now? What is your impression? Is it very low, very low confidence, low, medium, high, or even very high? And we would love to uh, see you all answering these questions because later on we're gonna come back to that. And with this, I think we're gonna continue. Wolfgang? Yeah, I think we'll be all ready to hand over and we get a quick um, case presentation of, of the recorded live case you will see. And Sam um, um, Dawkins um, from Oxford um, will present his case. Much. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, let me talk you through the case we're going to present a little bit later. So here is the background. This is an 81-year-old man who was referred to me. Uh, he has breathlessness walking on the flat. He's had a pretty rapid deterioration over the last six months, and he's had a recent hospital admission for intravenous diuresis. He has permanent atrial fibrillation, for which he's anticoagulated. He has chronic kidney disease, and he is at the frailer end of the spectrum. So let me start with the transthoracic echocardiogram. Um, don't think there's much debate here that the mitral regurgitation is severe. Um, uh, just draw your attention to some of the features of the, of the valve pathology there. So you can see bileaflet pathology, thickened leaflets, billowing. This has, has many of the hallmarks of Barlow's disease um, with a severe complex jet, but probably predominantly anteriorly directed. The short axis view across the mitral valve uh, confirms the findings previously, and this jet extends across the length of the line of coaptation. Um, looking at the apical views now, you can start to see where the major issue is. Um, there's a posterior mitral valve leaf that prolapse and flail with an anteriorly directed jet of severe mitral regurgitation. So moving on to the transesophageal echo views, uh, this is a uh, bicommissural view. Um, you can see that sort of billowing, billowing features that we saw before. Uh, you can see that there's a severe jet of mitral regurgitation just on the lateral side there. You can see a prolapse and a, and a ruptured cord. Um, and if we explain through that, uh, so the explain there is just on the lateral side of the middle of the valve, you can see the worst of the flail. So anterior mitral valve leaflet is a little bit thickened. The posterior mitral valve leaflet is uh, prolapsing. You can see that ruptured cord again there. Baseline gradient 3.5, uh, not surprisingly, pulmonary vein flow reversal. In 3D, uh, it looks actually a lot more complicated. You can see that the pathology extends for the length of P2 but neither P1 nor P3 are normal. You can see that they're billowing above the, the annular plane. Um, so very complex pathology. And a patient who we took through our local heart team. And the consensus was to consider transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. So I will stop there. Tobias. 
you just saw the case, what would you have done? Well, it's depending, of course, on the comorbidities of the patient. Um, so apparently this was an elderly um, patient. Um, so I think it's um, adequate to, to open this discussion also with regard to an interventional treatment of this patient. Of course, this patient definitely has to go um, under, undergo um, the discussion in the heart team. Yeah. Fabian, anything to add? On? I think it's quite an impressive anatomy, challenging, but B lateral or B leaflet prolapse. There is a kind of additional leaflet or something on the we could see on the 3D. So I think it was quite uh, uh, quite complex. So I will certainly also explore alternative in terms of uh, repair or replacement of the valve surgically, uh, but certainly not the easiest uh, anatomy for for transcatheterized edge repair. I think that's what we need to to take into consideration. But we saw the risk of the patient. He was, what, 82 years old, had to, uh, not good renal function? Yeah, 81, um, renal impairment, uh, frail, low BMI. So He's inoperable. Uh, Probably at least very high risk. Well, if you talk to a surgeon, every patient can be operated on, but... Uh, the question is, I guess the, the surgical risk, Maurizio, you're the surgeon in the, here. Yeah, obviously, I think uh, when you see BMI 19, uh, it is by itself already an information to say, okay, maybe let's look for alternative. Obviously, you can operate on him, but the risk is definitely high. I would not say he's inoperable, but I think despite the challenging anatomy, this is clearly a Barlow disease. There is a leaflet annular discontinuity. There is a clear flail, so you can target a lesion with if you, if you aim for a repair edge to edge leaflet therapy, but there are multiple indentations, so it's definitely a challenging anatomy, but uh, I would definitely explore a transcatheter option for this case rather than surgery. But now you're saying transcatheter options, we do have replacement in, in Europe available, we have also repair options. What is your take on that? Obviously, uh, my personal opinion is that if you can do a good repair and good means that you acutely reduce MR and you can provide a durable result, this means good repair. It is and it will be always better than a replacement, especially for degenerative etiology like in this case. In this specific anatomy, even if it is challenging, there is, the, there is a clear target, there is a flail. A barlow with no flail and multiple jet would be something different, but here I think even if it is challenging, if you respect the symmetry of the valve, you can target the lesion and you can achieve a potentially optimal and durable repair. So I would do go you, for repair. Do you need some? Do I have some additional information from Echo for your decision, or what you have seen is sufficient? Well, I think it is sufficient to say that it is doable to do a good repair, yes. There are no calcification. You have to pay attention to this cleft-like indentation. Uh, for sure, it's something that is challenging. It's not an easy case, but it is feasible. I would not step away from trying edge to edge repair in this case. I think you can achieve good results, yes. Okay. Any other comments? When you mentioned uh, your replacement, I think this Barlow anatomy are quite difficult also for transcatheter replacement due to LVOT uh, obstruction. The leaflets are long generally, so it's... Uh, but you know, I, I would be interested also in uh, Valveria, baseline, this kind of information, giving you a little bit more in, um, insight into your, your procedural strategy as well. So who thinks that the patient will get off the table with a very good result regarding MR reduction? Okay. Okay. Very, so the, very we had, we had so I guess we, we have the poll and the, the level of confidence right now achieving significant and sustained mitral rotation with the Pascal system. The confidence is on a medium level. Probably uh -huh. the five of you didn't vote, I guess, huh? Okay. Well, I think we're going to continue, um, and we would love to see. Now you, Fabian, talk to us a little bit about the versatility, the accuracy, and the control with the new Pascal Precision System. Yes, yes. What is your experience with this? Let me, let me introduce maybe a little bit um, the new feature of the of the of the device, and and that I will I will show you a case which is a quite challenging one uh, to show that you are able to um, to achieve a good result, but that's a tricuspid case. So you know you will. You will enjoy it as wrong well. Wrong session here. 
So that's that's a device. So the, 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 the people in the room uh, who are um, familiar with uh, with um, with the Pascal device, we of course recognize it because um, the the basics of the catheter did not change so much. But what you can see is that first we have a, a rail of this device for stabilization. Uh, we still have the three different catheters: the guide sheath, the steerable catheter, and the uh, the implant catheter handle that has been uh, modified. And the handle, the, the part of the catheter that has been modified uh, the most uh, for this, uh, for this um, uh, precision generation. It's still a 22 French uh, catheter, three independent delivery catheters that give you a lot of flexibility and also the ability to navigate very easily um, either in the, in the left atrium or in the right atrium when you are treating the, the tricuspid valve. And what has been changed also is the, the, the way you, you um, steer your catheter and the catheter itself, so you have you a much more accurate implant control. You have an improved handle design. You see that the handle is covered now and that the release uh, mechanism of the, of the Pascal is actually extremely uh, predictable and very easy to use. So we are close to a one operator um, catheter that you can really steer without so much of the previous um, uncontrolled movement uh, we had with, uh, with the previous version. In terms of implant, it's still the same, so it's a 19 0 implant. You have two versions of this implant, the, the P10 implant, which is the largest implant we, we use for the, the mitral or the tricuspid valve with a 10 millimeter width, uh, a spacer in the middle that um, is designed to uh, optimize the coaptation and uh, further reduce uh, mitral or tricuspid regurgitation. And uh, finally, you see that we have a wide implant with 26 millimeter of wingspan, giving you a very easy uh, capture of the, of the leaflet. The ACE is uh, the smaller version, probably the one that is the most used uh, currently. And you see that uh, you have a smaller spacer, you have a smaller width as well that, uh, that uh, give you still a good reduction of either mitral or tricuspid regurgitation. And finally, and that's important, the two implants have exactly the same width in terms of uh, uh, capture capturing the leaflet, which is facilitating uh, the insertion of the leaflet into, into that device. So as I mentioned, uh, I just wanted to show how you can treat really challenging anatomy with a good control of the position of the device. So it's a 70-year-old, 77-year-old uh, patient. He had heart transplantation. Uh, complex uh, disease, coronary artery disease, and the patient was uh, at multiple biopsy, of course, uh, in the course of his, of his life. And what was the result of that was a very severe tricuspid regurgitation, mechanical, after the biopsy, and he was hospitalized uh, several times for right heart decompensation and had also some late sign of this uh, chronic tricuspid regurgitation, chronic renal failure and ascites. So just to show you the anatomy, that's of course a challenging anatomy, with a big gap that you can see here, a flail septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve and a gap of about nine, nine millimeter. And that's the kind of, of anatomy you are really able to treat in a very accurate way because the steering of the, of the catheter has been much improved. The, the, the positioning of the catheter is, is easier. You can see here the, the grasping of the leaflet. Of course, the ability to optimize as well. So you see that uh, the, during the optimization, the septal leaflet has been, um, and, or the septal clasp have been reopened and you move the catheter uh, in a very uh, controlled way now uh, with this new um, uh, steerable catheter and finally you achieve an, opti an optimization that the first implant and of course as you could imagine uh, the, the, this, um, this procedure required several implants so at the end we implanted uh, three A's um, in, in that patient with, uh, with a very good uh, final result, despite of uh, a primary um, organic TR uh, at the beginning of the procedure. So let me conclude by saying that uh, compared to the previous iteration, the Pascal Precision System offer an improved catheter stability uh, and steerability as well. You are more precise, by the way. And uh, the new handle design facilitates uh, clasp actuation and device deployment. I think that's a very important point as well. It's more predictable. And finally, you keep this 19 0 implant design that minimizes the tension on the, on the leaflet. Thank you very much.
David, this was great, um, although it was not the Mitro case. The wrong one. Uh, yeah, yeah, the wrong session. But now <laughs> I think we continue directly with, with Sam, and he's telling us a little bit more about the technology um, and gives us another introduction. Another tricuspid case? I thought we'd go with Mitro this time. Ah, okay, good. This is the Pascal Precision System. I'm just going to talk through the components. Here is the guide. Uh, on the guide, there's the guide flex, um, which you can do to correct your a use to correct your AP trajectory. Here is the steerable. That's uh, very similar to the previous generation. There's a fin, which in most patients is at two o'clock, and then there's flex on the steerable, which flexes in the medial lateral plane. This is the precision uh, implant handle. Uh, so the components here look slightly different. So these are the sliders. Uh, there's a dark gray and a light gray. Dark gray usually posterior in most patients. Uh, the black knob is the uh, implant actuation knob. That's for closing and opening the implant. And the white cap is uh, covering the mechanism for release. So you can see the two sutures there and the blue cable release. Um, so what I thought I would demonstrate to you is the uh, clip orientation with this device. So as you can see, we're 90 degrees off. So I'm going to open with the implant handle. And we're open there. You can see on x-ray. And what I'd just like to demonstrate to you is, is that it really is one-to-one -one torque. So if I turn the implant, it turns very easily. And unlike the previous generation, you don't actually need to do any counter torque on the steerable. So I'm just going to stay in the middle of the valve here. And then what you can do is lower one by one. So that's anterior and that's posterior. Yeah, I think quite impressive. Federico, have you experience with the system? Yeah, uh, actually I actually have done uh, a number of cases. I think uh, uh, what, what he, he has said is really, really true. I mean, uh, precision has improved a lot, and uh, especially uh, the increase in thickness in the implant catheter really delivers uh, what you need in terms of torqueability, and you have a great demonstration in rotating the implant uh, above the valve. Here you go. But what about yeah. you? We have some experience as well. To me, it was a, a significant step forward in this, in this device. Uh, it's much more predictable. And uh, it corrects some deficiency in the previous one. When, when you turn on the device, it, it's, it, the, the previous version was a little bit anterior or posterior. You have to counterbalance. And this is now really one one or really precise. And, and I think it's, it's much, much, much improved. So do we, Tobias, do you think this will translate into important clinical endpoints that the results even get better or are we getting quicker or we will gain safety um, with this uh, iteration of the system? So probably yes, uh, with regard to procedure times and, and other procedural factors and, and it might also help with our approach which we have in tubing and with deep sedation. So it makes the whole procedure more stable, uh, and I see um, in particular advantages in uh, in, in tricuspid, uh, where you sometimes have uh, problems with this floppy um, design of the previous system. So it gives you more stability and reliability in in tricuspid. Yeah. Hey, I think it's a big step forward. Uh, we have this impression. Um, but the implants didn't change. So we have two options, and I think I hand over to you, Tobias. Um, you will introduce us um, to, to this um, um, implant selection discussion, which is very important because we have it on the shelf, but we don't know what to use in what situation. Yes, exactly. So if I have the slides, so Fabian already mentioned that we have two devices. And we have gathered experience now for the last since the last two years with a Pascal. Uh, 10 millimeter device and the Pascal ACE device. Um, so as you know, both um, devices share common features, uh, which is um, the central spacer. Uh, you already saw these slides uh, by Fabian, and it's really helpful to reduce the regurgitant area. And of course, um, the, the pedals that are designed to, to um, reduce stress concentrations on the leaflets, um, and of course, the clasps that allow for selective uh, grasping. So, yeah, you saw the slides, and um, yeah, I talked about the differences um, and the, the, the common features. 
Um, so another common feature is the elongation feature, which is, I think, really helpful in difficult, challenging situations where you encounter interactions with a caudal network. Um, it really helps you to, to um, solve this, um, the situations uh, either below the valve, uh, or you can also use it um, to enter the valve, um, in particular in commissural locations, and maybe also during a second device um, strategy to avoid interaction with the first design um, device. And then, of course, there's uh, uh, the retention elements um, on the class, which is a one row of um, retention elements, which allows for, for multiple grasping, actually, from my experience, without major injury um, and trauma on the leaflets. So um, within uh, the group, um, we discussed whether there could be preferences for the one for one device uh, over the other. Um, and uh, of course, um, there are overlapping indications, and this is still an ongoing discussion. But we felt that there are some situations where the Pascal um, system, the 10 millimeter device, might be a better option, um, which is in situations where you have restricted or shorter leaflets, and of course, in functional mitral regurgitation, where you have a central regurgitation jet in A2, P2. And then there might be situations where the Pascal ACE is the preferred <coughs> option. Um, I told you that this, this might be the, the, um, the case in commercial um, locations um, where you um, um, gain advantages um, uh, with a narrower design of the Pascal um, ACE, which is uh, six millimeters versus uh, 10 millimeters for the Pascal uh, original device. Uh, and that uh, also avoids the interaction with dense cordae. It might be also an option in, with longer leaflets and degenerative for mitral uh, regurgitation patients, and I'm thinking about um, patients with a prolapse. And then there are still some um, consensus needed. Um, what about calcifications near the grasping zone, um, large flail gaps, and a small mitral valve area below four square centimeters, um, and situations where you have severe tethering and clefts. So um, we will have now a discussion on a case space um, on case based scenarios, um, and I'm um, glad that I'm joined by by expert experienced implanters. Um, so maybe uh, Mauricio, you will start with your first case. Yeah, with pleasure. Thanks a lot. I don't know if you can show the slide of the first case, which is actually one case that fall in the thanks the, a bit in the gray area. So the third part of the of the screen that you showed where it's still maybe a matter of discussion which device would be the, the most adapt to use. It is a case of a really old lady, 87-year-old lady, who got a TAVI a few months before the index procedure that I'm going to show you with good result. She also got a pacemaker due to AV block after TAVI. But uh, already at the moment of the TAVI, there was a severe mixed etiology mitral regurgitation that we decided at the moment not to treat and to follow up after the TAVI to, to check whether there would have been any symptomatological improvement. But despite the good functioning of the TAVI prosthesis, the patient didn't improve. So we face up with the uh, need to treat also the mitral. Uh, and actually the anatomy was quite complex because as you will see now, there was also Together with annular dilatation, there were some uh, calcification in the annulus, so there was MAC. There was also some calcification at the basis of the leaflet. And you may see that uh, the opening of the valve area is, is not that optimal. So the leaflet are not moving so well, you can see in the 3D, that the opening valve area is somehow reduced. The jet is quite central, maybe slightly lateral, but it is, a, I would say, still in A2P2 region. And there is already a five millimeter of mercury of mean baseline gradient. Obviously the gradient is partially due also to the mitral regurgitation, but I think it is uh, somehow obvious that this valve is not opening in an optimal way, not opening properly. So this is a valve that somehow may end up with increased gradient of risk of stenosis if you do edge to edge therapy. And that's why we decided to, in this specific case, to go for a P10 implantation, so a Pascal P10 implant located um, in the correspondence of the jet, so slightly lateral as compared to the proper A2P2. And the rational why we decided to use P10 is basically due to the, the presence of the spacer. If you have a big spacer, you don't do actually a real edge-to-edge -edge approximation, but you approximate the edge of the leaflet to the spacer on the two sides. So at the end, you have less tension on the leaflet. You pull less on the leaflet, and the resulting a residual area is bigger. So despite you, you use a, a bigger implant, at the end you have 
bigger residual valve area. So this was the reason why we decided to use a P10 in this specific case. And here you see the implant. We, we were quite, uh, as I showed you before, in correspondence of the jet, so uh, slightly lateral. We didn't need to do many clasping attempts, so it was a straightforward capture of the leaflet. And with one single device, we were able to have this, I would say, good result for this challenging anatom with a trivial residual lateral MR, and the gradient didn't change. So the final gradient was five millimeter of mercury. So I think this is a one specific situation that the presence of a bigger spacer could lead to optimal result even in presence of high risk for stenosis. The clinical course was then uh, uh, favorable, the patient improved, and uh, I think this is one example of the typical example of the third, uh, let's say, gray zone where it, it may be questionable, but I think it was a, probably a good and rational decision to go for P10 in this case. So there's a big discussion going on whether there are changes between the Pascal Ace and then the Pascal device with regard to the gradient. So what is your personal experience? Um, is the device size really critical for, for the gradient? It's a good question because I think we don't have data to really sustain that uh, the presence of the bigger spacer result in lower gradient. But from a pathophysiological standpoint and anatomical standpoint, I think it makes a lot of sense that if you pull less on the leaflet because you have the spacer, at the end you will have a, a larger orifice on the two sides of the, of the device, as demonstrated by this uh, computational model. Obviously it's not, has to be validated in data, but uh, whenever there are calcific portion of the valve or risk of stenosis, I rather prefer to go for a P10 due to the presence of the spacer. This is you presented a case with calcification, so uh, what is your opinion, um, uh, so how do you evaluate the, the calcification before the procedure and what would you say are characteristics of the calcification that prevent you from an edge-to-edge -edge therapy and, and when, when sometimes when is the situation where the Pascal Ace might be a better option here with regard to calcification? Yeah. I think um, it is uh, quite important to, to see, like the case that we show, uh, I showed was uh, calcification was located at the annulus and at the basis of the leaflet, or maybe at the insertion of core, and not in the, in the grasping zone. So it's really important, in my opinion, try to avoid the cases where uh, you need to grasp in the calcium, because here, even if you can capture the leaflet and you can have a good acute result, the, the risk may be of... Uh, detachment or whatever is probably high. So these are the cases where probably edge to edge is not indicated. I would not say that in those cases, ACE would perform better than, than P10. Uh, if you have a big flail, so if you have MAC calcification, but you have a flail, I would go probably for, uh, for ACE. Uh, but if you have calcification and risk of stenosis, I would favorite P10. But okay, that's fair enough. So we have to move uh, on and uh, Frederico will present the second case. Yeah, thank you. So the second case falls into the second part of the chart. So the message behind the case is that uh, when we treat commissural lesions, uh, ACE, uh, Pascal ACE uh, is a good option. Uh, the patient is an 80 years old male, quite frail, uh, not other significant comorbidities. He was admitted for shortness of breath with uh, New York class three. And he had a severe mitral regurgitation with uh, some degree of annular dilatation and a multiscalar prolapse of both uh, uh, leaflets. Here you see uh, the transesophageal echo. Uh, the annulus was measuring 37 by 37 millimeters, and you see there is a significant lateral uh, commissural bilifflet prolapse uh, with also some uh, prolapse of the area of P1 and P2, and uh, there are two quite well-defined jets coming, one from the lateral portion of, of the valve and the other from the medial portion of the valve. I think 3D imaging conveys a better idea of the uh, complex anatomy uh, of this patient, and you see how in the lateral portion of the valve we have both uh, uh, P1 and uh, A1, which are definitely coming above the uh, mitral uh, annular plane, and also in the medial area of the valve we have uh, P3, uh, which is prolapsing. 
the strategy <clears throat> for this case was to use uh, two Pascal uh, ACES device. We had access to the precision system for uh, uh, this case. Uh, and uh, the idea was to start first on the more complex lesion, uh, which is that of the uh, lateral commissure. And then after uh, securing uh, that area, those leaflets to switch to treat uh, the medial commissure where the disease burden of the uh, mitral valve is somehow less and I expected it to be easier. So uh, harder things first uh, for the strategy uh, of this case. Uh, this is the first uh, Pascal ACE implant. Uh, what uh, we like to do is to cross by elongation in order to minimize traveling and movements. Uh, uh, and often by elongated, uh, you can easily reach the paddle spatial junction at the level of the leaflets, and then you don't need to uh, advance anymore. Uh, then we clasp the, uh, the uh, leaflets, and you see in the uh, bottom image that uh, the result at the region of the lateral commissure is quite good with a tiny residual jet coming close by from, uh, from the implant. And the only residual jet to be treated now is the uh, medial one. So we switch, we move on to the second step of the procedure. Uh, we uh, tackle the uh, medial uh, commissural jet. Again, here we cross uh, by uh, elongating. I like also some uh, slight degree of aortic hugger trajectory for this lesion because uh, you know when you have the posterior uh, uh, leaflet prolapsing uh, uh, slight uh, uh, aortic parallelism can ease uh, uh, clasping of the leaflet and also after closing the pascal implant uh, in the medial commissure we see a very tiny uh, residual jet at the level of the implant and you see on 3d color that the residual jet is definitely uh, not significant this is the uh, our final uh, imaging, you see there is a grade one residual jet uh, with a low gradient and two Pascal ACEs, one for each commissure. Again, the uh, clinical course of the patient was uneventful with mild uh, residual MR in that complex anatomy. He was asymptomatic at 30 day follow up since this was done uh, with the precision system is a very recent case. We do not have a longer follow up at the moment, but we follow up the patient. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, commissural uh, lesions are well treated with Pascal ACE, ACE and especially with the use of the precision system. Okay. I think because of time constraints, we move on to the last case, and, and, okay. and then we have a common discussion on, on all the That's cases. Fantastic. Okay. So we are moving to the next case, that is a case of atrial FMR. So the case is a 77-year-old male, former smoker with dyslipidemia. History of ischemic heart disease, one on STEM in 2017, and a PCI to, to the right coronary artery, and with no significant diseases in the other arteries. Patient has arterial flutter in 2018 with two ablations and paroxysmal AF. In November 21, he was admitted to the acute pulmonary edema. At that time, the echo showed moderate uh, left ventricular dysfunction with semi MR. Patient has as well moderate COPD and a prostatic neoplasm. Currently, is under uh, best medical treatment with no further admissions, but still some symptoms of shortness of breath. This is the echo. As we can observe, we, we have a severe central mitral regurgitation. Uh, probably the mechanism after discussing with the, the guys of imaging, uh, we don't see any uh, signal of, of ischemic MR, so uh, the mechanism is uh, more likely to be annular dilation and loss of captation reserve, so it was classified uh, as atrial functional mitral regurgitation. So the decision was to, pr to proceed with um, a mitral estuary repair with the Pascal Precision System. In this case, with a Pascal ACE implant, on the rationale of the patient has long leaflets, we aim to insert the maximum of the tissue and aim for one device strategy. So uh, this is the improvement steerability of the device. As you can observe, it's precisely positioned over the uh, target jet and one of the most uh, significant improvements is the ease of the advance of the implant catheter and the and the clocking of uh, with the one one response that this is a significant improvement compared to the prior uh, version the, the device is, is clocked in the right position after checking the clasp we can advance the device now we are advancing the device into the left ventricle and uh, we can do several um, 
pullbacks very easily. You can observe this cannot be done with the prior version. We close a little bit the device and we do like sh short movements uh, to and fro to uh, insert the leaflets. And finally, in the last movement, both leaflets are in and we drop the clasps. And you will see in a second the real time result when we are closing the device very slightly while advancing the device very easily. Uh, great reduction to trace mitral regurgitation and a concomitant reduction in the left atrium pressures. This is the release of the device. It is something that has been as well improved in this new system, very fast and very safe. And this is the final result with trace MR and uh, no significant gradient. We observe as well an improvement in the hemodynamic conditions with an uh, improvement in the pulmonary vein flow. And the patient was discharged and eventful with mild mitral regurgitation is doing very well at one month follow up. Thank you very much. Jörg, I've seen a lot of ACE there. Um, do we still need the Pascal? Until I would say 15 minutes ago, I would have said no. But seeing Mauricio's case, I, I was really intrigued. This is fantastic. Having a mitral valve orifice area with a gradient uh, of five in the beginning and then still ending up with a gradient of five and no MR is, is really um, something which I haven't seen in the, in, up to now. And the other... A minority of number, but it can still be helpful. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, so it's think, really fantastic. So I think, yeah. yes, maybe we need the, the larger devices also in the future. And the other two cases were also great. Uh, both the degenerative uh, case with the two very separate um, jets on both commissions treated with no MR left and the secondary MR patient. This is uh, really, we're getting to, to patients where we're ending up with an MR rate of one plus or less at a very high confidence level. And I'm hoping that our poll at the end will change, um, that, you, that also you get more um, confidence in this kind of therapies. Yeah, I totally agree. It's not just another clip. What we learned over the last couple of years, it's totally innovative technology. And I think we also learned something about the spacer. At first we thought it would, would give us a gradient and in the end it's totally different. And I think this is the reason why these systems should be modified because it helps us to, to end with excellent results. But now we were very case-based so far. And now, Jörg, I think I have to hand over to you because we have the first randomized data uh, for the Pascal system um, from the CLASP 2D trial. And, and, and Jörg will uh, bring the information of the trial now to you. And then we add on and in, in two um, other talks then the clinical experience um, 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 in the field. I think it's coming then from um, Cologne and um, um, from, where was the other? Uh, from, from, from Essen. Yeah. They are here over there. Yes, Perfect. Sir. So, Wolfgang, thank you very much. So, we have seen some very interested cases. Um, we all know also that we have very different anatomies. The anatomy can be straightforward, easy. So, we are looking here at, at more the, on the left side to green patients, but it can also be more complex. And although you have seen uh, perfect cases today, it's not always the case. So these are more the complex patients in the middle. But we also have uh, on the right side some, some patients where at least up to now we think that the, an edge-to-edge -edge repair is prohibitive and should probably not be performed um, that because the patients are really unsuitable and the results are not that great. So the class 2 d study is uh, the first randomized clinical trial investigating um, the Pascal device compared to the MitroClip to investigate if it's as safe and as effective as the MitroClip. And as you know, all the patients with degenerative MR were assessed in the core lab and with the um, steering committee. And if they were all randomizable so that, um, that they have this, that the pathology was acceptable, then they were enrolled into the randomized cohort and randomized in a two-to-one fashion into the Pascal and the MitoClip system. And all those patients um, where the anatomy was more complex 
um, those patients were not going to be able to be treated with a mitoclip because the mitoclip IFU has some um, some uh, limitations uh, raised, so <clears throat> some concerns because some data or there's not enough data for some specific um, anatomies. So these patients were then included into the Pascal 2D registry. And I'm going to show you this in this spotted like green and the yellow patient group. Now, what kind of results did we achieve in the class 2D study? Let's look at the two patient cohorts. Age is very comparable. But if you look at the uh, more red highlighted parameters, you see that in the registry, the risk is higher. There's more atrial fibrillation. This mitral orifice area is smaller more renal insufficiency, more pulmonary hypertension, more pacemakers, more home oxygen use, which I think was, is also something intriguing, more peripheral disease. So the registry cohort is really a much more sicker cohort than the patients um, in, in the randomized cohort. Having said that, the overall outcome in terms of safety was very promising. Um, in the randomized cohort, the Pascal um, had an event rate of only 3.4%. In the registry cohort, it's still acceptable with an event rate of 11.2%. And you see that the main driver for these events were bleeding complications, not necessarily at the exercise, but also more GI bleeding. What about the uh, outcomes in, term of, uh, in terms of mortality outcomes and heart failure hospitalizations? Here you see first mortality on all cause mortality in the upper line, almost no difference, 94%, 93%, so very comparable. And also in terms of heart failure hospitalizations, considering the higher morbidity in, in the registry, also very comparable and acceptable in the high 90s. What about MR reduction? Because now we're seeing a slight difference. MR reduction in the randomized score was still very, very high um, with an MR rate of 2 plus or less in 98%, MO1 plus or less 84% in the randomized cohort. And also the data compared to the mitochondria are very comparable, showing a non-inferiority in terms of this endpoint at six months. The registry on the right side, you see that the MR2 plus or less rate is also very comparable, 92.4%. But we see a little bit smaller rate of MR1 plus or less with 56%. So you see, it's, they are more complicated to treat. And this is shown here with these um, results. However, the functional improvement, and this is something I found very interesting, is it was very comparable. 86 and 84% of patients had a New York Heart Class 1 or 2 at six month follow up. And we saw also a very comparable increase in, <clears throat> in the KCCQ score with 17 of uh, almost 15%, so not a big, really big difference, indicating that perhaps also in these very complex patients, we might be uh, also be sufficient if we reduce the MR to 2 plus. Um, or less, although I think we should always try to get to better results. So in conclusion, considering all those differences in, in patient mitral valve characteristics, the outcomes of the PASCAL system are very favorable and in both the randomized but also the registry cohorts. At six months, both cohorts demonstrated a significant sustained MR reduction with more than 90% achieving MR2 plus or less. The safety is, is very good, high survival rates and a high freedom of heart failure hospitalizations is, is seen at six months and significant improvement in symptoms, neural heart class and quality of life. So in summary, for the class 2D registry, I think we, uh, the class 2D study, the entire trial, the randomized court and, and the registry, I think we can say that the Pascal repair system is a beneficial therapy for prohibitive risk patients with significant symptomatic primary disease across a wide range of mitral valve anatomies. Now, these are all patients from selected patients. And the question is now, how does it become, um, can, can this data be transferred in less selected commercial cases? 
And I'm going to go just briefly into the data from the my class study, which have been presented today. And you see on the left side the data what I have shown just right now, the class 2D trial. And I put the class, the my class study results, the commercial results in Europe um, on the right side. And you see in terms of, for example, DMR reduction in this DMR cohort of my class is also very, very favorable. 86% at one year had a <clears throat> MR rate of two plus or uh, less. Um, no, of one. So one percent or less, and uh, two plus is also even a hundred percent. So very very comparable um, compared to the randomized uh, study. Heart uh, mortality outcomes also shown here, um, very comparable. Of course, in in the um, in the clinical experience and or commercial experience, the patients tended to be a little bit. Um, more sicker, the survival rate was even there than almost um, around 87% compared to the 94% in the registry and the 95% in the, uh, and, and the um, randomized trial. And New York Heart Class, also very consistent, very high rates of New York Heart Class 1 or 2 at one year follow up, also in the my class study. So, in summary, I think um, also showing here the KCCQ, very similar results showing that um, with these um, articles in press, we have a good evidence with the Pascal system in degenerative MR patients. And the my class study confirms these favorable outcomes in a less selected commercial European ex um, experience. Thank you very much. Yeah, terrific. I think we should move on. Um, we, we heard a lot about degenerative disease, and I think now we will see a mixed population um, are coming out of um, um, Cologne. Um, and Victor Maury is, is moderating it. Good afternoon. Thank you very much to, uh, for contributing to this session. Um, we have just heard this beautiful data from uh, Jörg Hausleiter, a randomized controlled trial. Echo Core Lab adjudicated, Clinical Events Committee adjudicated. So you might ask, do we need observational data at all? But I would like you to have a glimpse on the inclusion process of one of the landmark trials of functional MR. You see 80 centers, 42 inclusion and exclusion criteria, and this led to one and a half thousand patients screened, but finally only 600 patients randomized. 1.3 patients per center and year randomized in the COAP trial. And in the class 2D, it was quite similar. Only 1.4 patients per center per year were actually randomized. So I believe many of the patients we treat on a daily basis, they are not represented in these trials. And this led us to a, yeah, to a um, real world registry, which we established in 2019, right after the approval of the P10. We included all 309 consecutive patients treated at 10 high volume centers in Germany, no inclusion, no exclusion criteria, and at that time only the P10 was available. So the initial results, they have been published two years ago, so I just want to go um, briefly on that. 93% of patients with MR grade 2 or less at 30 days and good functional improvement with 72% of patients in new high functional class one or two at 30 days. So today, I would like to show you two new analyses from um, this data set. As uh, Professor Rothbauer said, it's a mixed population. It's quite typical. Half the patients were functional MR, one third of the patients were degenerative MR, and uh, the rest were considered mixed by the contributing centers. And we do actually see differences in the efficacy. So at 30 days, 93% of patients in the overall cohort were in, uh, had a result of MR two plus or less, with very, very good results in the FMR and mixed pair populations. 96%, 100% of patients had MR two or less, with a little bit or with lower efficacy in the DMR group of 82% of patients having MR2 or less. And this comes then down to clinical success rate. This is a um, combined safety and efficacy endpoint, which was originally introduced in the CLASP approval trial of 
uh, almost 90% in the overall cohort, 75% in DMR, and far over 90% in functional and mixed populations. The next analysis I would like to show you is a comparison to the MITRE clip. So we matched this cohort of 309 patients to a very well-established um, cohort of MITRE clip patients. It's from the Rhine uh, Heart Failure Network Rhineland. This is a well-established um, patient cohort of over 1,000 patients. And please note, there are different inclusion um, periods. So we match these patients mainly on parameters of MR severity and damage to the left ventricular, uh, left to the, for the left ventricle and the left atrium. So not mainly patient characteristics, but more characteristics of the mitral regurgitation and the left ventricle. So this resulted in 307 matched pairs. So we could match almost all of our Pascal patients. In the Pascal group, only Pascal implant, P10 at that time. And in the mitral clip group, most of the patients were treated with first or second generation mitral clip. I don't want to go too much into detail of the patient characteristics, but these patients, they were even more sick than what we've seen in the um, CLASP to the registry. Um, and despite matching, there were some differences. So the mitral clip patients, they were kind of sicker. They had a higher Euroscore 2. They ha had a higher proportion of previous cardiac surgery, and they had already at baseline a slightly but highly significant higher transmitral gradient. So, regarding technical success, major adverse events at 30 days, but also single leaflet device attachment, there were basically no significant differences between the two devices. But we have just heard the clip already had a little bit higher baseline gradient, but after adjustment for this baseline gradient, after mitral clip, the gradients were a little bit, but significantly higher. And also the increase in transmitral gradient was higher in the mitral clip, clip, mitra clip group, putting a higher proportion of these patients in a, in a group with a mean gradient more than five millimeters of mercury. Regarding MR reduction, they were equally with about um, 94 and 92% of patients in MR uh, grade two or less at discharge and similar results at 30 days. If we're looking at MR1+, plus, we saw a little bit more durable result in the Pascal group compared to MitroClip. So let me summarize. I believe many patients are not really represented in the, in the trials we do have. So I believe observational data is important. What we have seen in our study is the efficacy is a little bit lower for DMR patients, probably representing the really complex anatomies we are treating on a daily basis. The gradient was a little bit higher, but that has, we haven't seen this in, in 2D in the mitral clip group and the result was a little bit more durable with Pascal compared to the mitral clip. Thank you very much for your attention. I think we saw already very intriguing data. Uh, we, we still wait for the discussion and Peter Lüdecke from Essen uh, will give us some insights into his precision experience. And uh, as we know, he's always coming with data. So we were very curious what you have to tell us today. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation also from my side. And these are very preliminary data. We have done 14 cases on the mitral side um, until now. So it's just an imagination <clears throat> of what this um, precision technology can do. This is my obvious conflict of interest. And I want to make two points today. First of all, I want to recapitulate, the I call it the characteristic nature of the Pascal device to allow you to assess the post-delivery result more precisely than at our institution, the reality at our institution, than the mitral clip device. We talked about this right at this location here last year. And since this publication, we got a lot of feedback from other users, from other colleagues that they see the same and these data need to be confirmed in larger trials. Maybe we extract this from pro um, prospective trials. And it was a question of debate. What goes into this equation that allows you as an operator to predict whether you have a 
recurrence of AR, MR or deterioration of MR? Is it the anatomy? This is uh, maybe a factor. We think that the most important factor is the device itself because MitraClip and Pascal are both uh, approximation um, devices, but this is the only in common. Everything else is completely different. And what makes um, the delivery system or the implant catheter? How important is the stiffness, the the, the lever arm, we know that the Pascal device is de um, detached from the atrial side, while the mitral clip is detached from the ventricle side, so this might be a difference. And I was interested to see whether the innovation of the precision generation might impact this or just improve the whole procedure, because I expected not to have an impact on the predictability or um, a bad impact on the predictability, because when you detach it from the atrium, you have not so much um, lever arm, so uh, it was interesting to see what will happen. And this is an insight into an industrial data set, not our data. It's collected from the, from the clinical specialists, which attend all the procedures in the field. And these were the first 250 cases done with uh, uh, Pascal precision generation. And it's important to mention that most of the centers did less than five procedures. And what we see, that the acute efficacy is excellent, as we know <laughs> this. But what was interesting for me to see is that the average procedure time was quite short. 53 minutes, so it seems that you don't need any learning curve when using this new technology. It's just an improvement that definitely makes the procedure faster. And then I want to go through a case with you. We treated at our institution. I don't want to dive too much into the patient's history. As you can see here, it's a massive MR. Um, it's a mixed MR with a primary FMR component. I think most of the cases we treat are definitely mixed cases when we go into detail of the anatomy. And as we discussed um, earlier today, it's our strategy uh, that we take a P10 as our primarily um, uh, device in FMR patients. <clears throat> um, this is what we did in this case. We upfront decided to make a two-device strategy. And this is the TUE after placing the first device. And I want to highlight two aspects in this slide. The first one is when you look on the X-ray, you can see that during the detachment, situation, there is a little bounce of the cathedral. This is something I was not used to from the Pascal system because it was so flexible that I always had immediately a curve and there was a residual uh, flex on the steering cathedral. And I um, saw this very seldom that uh, there was a bounce after releasing the um, device. <clears throat> And I want to highlight that I don't know if you see this on the slides, but there is a dense cord going straight into the area of residual uh, regurgitation. And so we decided what is not so common, we can discuss on this, that for the second uh, situation, for the second um, regurgitation area, we would, uh, wanted to take a Pascal A, so placing Pascal 10 um, and, and an ACE <clears throat> because of the dense cords. And I was interested to see whether... Um, it will be easy to steer down there, and it was quite easy with the precision generation. It was uh, just steering down, grasping the leaflets. And I also want to highlight two aspects in these images. First is, you again see this bouncing. I, when, when I released this device, I had not the feeling that there is so much tension on the, on the steering catheter, but there was. But when you look on the, um, the color images, you see they are just before and after the release of the Pascal ACE. And there is completely no change of the color signal. So when we remind ourselves on the equation I, I started at the beginning, I think this is more or less a proof because I saw this, 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 um, this behavior of this uh, new precision generation, nearly all of the cases we treated. And I think this is more or less a proof of the principle that um, detaching the device from the atrium has, um, 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 uh, makes, the, makes the Pascal system more predictable compared to other technologies. This was the final result. And as you can imagine, that this patient has a relief of his uh, dyspnea symptoms. And so these are, this is not an, um, a real analysis. It's just a summary of the four, first 14 cases we've done. The efficacy was, was great, but I think we will face or challenge uh, challenging cases where we don't end up with excellent results. But what is interesting to see, even after doing more than 300 cases with the Pascal technology now, with Pascal Precision entering our center, 
even at our institution, we are just two operators, so we have both um, 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 high expertise with a, with a system. All of the cases were quite quicker. It's, um, it's not big numbers, but it was interesting to see that on average 10 minutes less for, um, for the procedure. And looking on the predictability aspect we analyzed last year, we saw that just one out of 14 patients showed a deterioration. So despite this um, supposedly tension in the system, there is no influence of the predictability aspect. And so these are my key takes um, I have from the experience until now. And thank you again for your attention and the invitation. So we were very afraid of that question, but it's already up there, and I think we, we have to discuss it now. And 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 uh, and the question goes to 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 Jörg and um, and Victor and Peter. Um, when should we then use the micro clip instead of using um, the Pascal system? What will be the indication? And 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 the reader or, or the the person who put down the question said already. Don't make it uh, dependent on your experience, and and but but just let me know when do I have to to cross which tool. Jörg, I think you have to start, <laughs> uh, although you hoped not. <laughs> well, the data has shown that in the majority of patients, um, from looking at the class to D data, that both devices work very very well in a large proportion of DMR patients. I think at the end, um, it's, it's, for most patients, it really ends up in the personal experience with the device. If you're very comfortable with one device, you will always get to very good results. Um, there are dedicated features of, of the Pascal system. We talked about that, about the flexible 90 null um, um, structure, which I think is, is very important. Um, for especially also thinner leaflets for the tricuspid leaflet. Um, there is the independent grasping function, which I think is a personally a little bit easier with the Pascal system, but it can also be performed with the MitroClip. So at the end, um, I think both devices have their place, um, and um, we will need probably to see some other studies more uh, in more complex patients, this yellow group, um, to see if the if there is a real differentiation between the two systems. Otherwise, I think um, other factors, including price, will make a big difference for most of the science. I don't know what 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 what's your take of that? Um, it, it might sound a little bit provocative, but when you see it from a patient's perspective and um, um, you present a patient both technologies and you say they have identical anatomical in and exclusion criteria, the data, real-world data, um, uh, prospective randomized data show non-inferiority or equal efficacy. But one of the devices has supposedly more safety features. Um, um, the reality at our institution is that um, uh, when we explain the patient that we tend to take the device with more supposedly safe features, that the patient goes the same way with us. And um, I think it's too early to um, extract an algorithm to say this is um, this is how we do it because um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's too young, the, te the technology is too young. But um, this is uh, how we do it, and this is how why I favor um, one over the other. Yeah. So you, you showed the div the comparison of those two cohorts, the MitroClip and the Ole Pascal cohort. What is your take of um, the two devices? I I believe it finally it comes down to comfort of the operator. We have seen from your data and from many data, you can achieve very good results with both devices. And um, we have seen these cases we have seen today. They're really complex cases. We've seen we can treat them with, mitra, uh, with, uh, with the Pascal device. So in the end, I believe it comes down to how comfortable are you with the individual device? And then it, we can't say we don't have the data yet to say this device or the other device is better for certain features. I was a little bit intrigued seeing this MR1 plus rate in the two cohorts. And uh, with the Pascal system having a little bit higher MR1 plus rate, 
which is also a little bit seen in, in the in the um, in the class 2D study in this early analysis of, of uh, 180 patients at six months. Um, but when you're looking at the microclip data, of course, your data is, is early generation, generation one and two. When we're looking here at the presentation of generation four, we have 90% of MR1 plus rate. Do you have a good understanding of what is the difference? Because you are highly experienced operators in the Rhine area. I mean, we also have now new devices on the MitraClip side. So maybe it's, uh, it's this, that we are now much more experienced. The, all the um, MitraClips implanted were implanted 2012 to 2018. So that's quite a um, long time ago. And the patients, they were, they were sicker. Maybe they were even more complex. So um, I believe probably the results are better now. Better now. Now we had the question, oh no, it's gone, about the elongation feature. And, and just very quickly, do, do, do we need to go with the second device in, in the closed position into the mitral valve? Shall we use the elongation feature? This was one of the questions. Oh, here's up again. Um, um, Fabian? I think the How second do, one, yeah, I would, I would go with a closed uh, device to avoid. You go with a closed device? Yeah, that's, what I, that's how I do it. But uh, maybe, maybe you elongate, I don't know. Yeah. That could be an option as well. Well, yeah, I tend to elongate uh, each time across uh, the mitral valve. So, I mean, that's just uh, what I do. I find it practical. So. I usually do it with, with the device closed. First one and, and of course, in the, in the second one or third one, uh, but but I see. I mean, the, the elongation is a super nice feature in case you get entrapped. Sometimes this is a nightmare with other devices. Uh, super safe in the commissures that I already mentioned. We saw the case of Federico, so that's a really important feature. Richo, a short comment. I I totally agree. I, I usually I, I enter with the device closed, and I use the elongation features if I get entrapped in corde. So one of the specific indications why I think. Uh, Pascal should be favorite is really commissural lesion to, to answer to the previous question. This is really a... But answering the question, the majority of you, three to one, are going in a closed position while you're using the elongated version to, to enter the ventricle. So... Hey, I think... We need to... Jörg, we, we have to move on. So, it's up to you now, Sam. You will explain to us some technical features and, and uh, your strategy. Great. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much. So back to the case I showed you at the beginning. Quick reminder, pretty complex pathology, uh, Barlow anatomy. Uh, the whole of the valve is abnormal, but there is a flail. If you look where the X-plane is cutting through the bicom here, there is a flail uh, and a very large posteriorly directed jet of severe mitral regurgitation. So just to show you where that is on the valve, it's around there. And so there's a flail here. Normally, when we're carrying out edge-to-edge -edge repair, what we're trying to do is to, to treat the damaged tissue. So you take the flail and try and treat all of the flail um, portion and, and constrain it within implant devices. You can't do that with Barlow pathology because the whole valve is abnormal. So in that case, you would just focus on where, where the worst of the pathology is. So our strategy here is to aim for this, this flail here. Um, and that's probably going to be a grasp in this kind of region here. And it seems very unlikely it's going to be uh, less than one, less than one, less than two devices. Um, just a, a moment on device selection. Uh, we've heard a bit about that already. Um, I have a pretty sim simple algorithm for it. Uh, if there's too much tissue, uh, use ACE. If there's too little tissue, use P10. So in this case, there's definitely too much tissue. So we're going to use ACE. Hey. So this was all theory, and unfortunately, you know the result, but um, 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 we are very curious of seeing now the case, and you will comment for us. Great, so um, we're crossing over to our recorded live case. So just to set the scene, we've done our transeptal. We're now steering down towards the mitral valve. Uh, if you look at the fluoroscopic screen, we're steering down and right, which is where we need to be for most people. So what the first step is, is to set up the imaging views. So in the uh, bottom left, you can see the echo. Jim Newton, who's doing my imaging for this case, is just sorting out a BICOM view. 
And once we've found that, we can sort out the medial lateral trajectory. Spending a bit of time getting the trajectories right uh, makes a big difference and actually speeds up the procedure later. So being very fastidious about where the transeptal is and the medial lateral trajectory and then the AP trajectory makes for a much more rapid procedure with a better result. So what we're doing here is, is pushing the implant into the patient a little bit and then putting a bit more uh, steerable flex on so that in the left-hand view, which is a slightly challenging bicom view as you can see, we're pointing more or less straight down through the valve. Um, what we're aiming to do is, is be over the medial side of the flail um, and uh, usually it's easiest to implant medial to lateral just because you have a bit more space uh, in, in that direction. So we've now fine-tuned our trajectories. We're aorta hugging a bit, but that probably favors us for grasping this um, complex posterior leaflet pathology. We're now under the valve, perhaps a little bit overclosed there. So you'll see we're just opening, opening the implant a tiny bit. And we're going to lift up and do some grasping. So the anterior leaflet is quite long. We have some tissue there. You can see the clasp bouncing. Posterior leaflet is slightly more challenging, but now resting very nicely on the uh, posterior paddle. So before and after every grasp, we check the uh, implant orientation uh, to make sure that we're not putting anything under any tension, um, because it's worth getting that as accurate as possible. Now, what I would just draw your attention to, if you look at that 3D view, the implant is dancing around a bit. And in retrospect, that probably is because we don't have quite enough anterior tissue. But what I would say is that this was quite a difficult grasp, and therefore we thought we would, we would see what we got. So because of all the turbulence, because of the uh, extremely mobile posterior leaflet, it was quite difficult to make this grasp. So as we close there, before and after every grasp, we check gradient, um, color, uh, pulmonary veins, systemic pressure, LA pressure. And what we can see here is we, we don't have a good enough result. Um, we have residual mitral regurgitation on both sides of the implant. That's not what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to leave a residual jet lateral, um, if at all. Um, and so if you look at the 3D on fast view here, you can see the problem. I, I think we don't have quite enough tissue. And I think our orientation is a little bit off. We're a little bit uh, counterclot from where we should be. Um, so we think we can do better. So we're now going to open the clasps, fix the orientation, and then have another go. One of the things I really like about the Pascal device is the ability to elongate. Uh, it gives me confidence to tackle more complicated anatomy, particularly where there's calcification, where you might be concerned about getting stuck. You just don't. If, 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 you're, in, if you're in trouble, if you're seeing leaflet interaction, just elongate, as we've done here. And you can easily come back into the left atrium. So we've now fixed our orientation. We've come a touch more medial. Uh, we've put a little bit of guide flex on to sort out the AP trajectory. So this all looks much nicer. Um, I tend to cross close. That's my practice. So opening the implant under the valve now. Um, we are now going to focus on trying to get a little bit more anterior leaflet tissue, because that seemed to be jumping around a bit uh, in, the, in the last attempt. We're just going to check. Even, even for a smaller movement as crossing the valve, we would always recheck the orientation just to make absolutely sure it hasn't moved. There's nothing more frustrating than getting a good grasp in a difficult valve and then realizing that the orientation is wrong. So it is worth, worth spending a bit of time on that. So looks like we have more anterior leaflet there, um, anterior clasp bouncing nicely. And now we're going to steer Clockwise, we see this in the mitral position, but particularly in the tricuspid position, you can do really quite big turns to, to optimize a leaflet. So we've uh, seen that the posterior leaflet is very nicely resting on the posterior paddle. Um, we have a big, uh, big amount of tissue there. Checking once again the uh, 3D orientation. Um, and if you remember what the appearance was last time, the implant is much more stable. It's not bouncing around as much as it was before. Orientation, we were aiming to be a tiny bit more clock than we were last time, which we've achieved. And so now what we're going to do is close the implant. With every time we close, we look at the V wave, we look at the systemic pressure. Often with the DMR cases, the systemic pressure change is really striking and can go up 20 or 30 points. And that's a really useful marker as to the effectiveness of your grasp. So in the 2D views, as the implant closed, you saw the leaflets being drawn in very nicely. It looks like we have lots of tissue. So it'll be interesting to see how much of an impact we've had this time on the residual mitral regurgitation. What Jim is uh, doing 
now is just running the X-plane through the implant to check that we've got lots of leaflet from both, both the anterior and the posterior leaflet. And then he's putting the implant where we think the residual pathology is. Um, it's a really important, if you're going to do multiple grafts, to be sure that wherever is left uh, is graspable. Um, so measuring the gradient now, you'll remember the gradient at the beginning was uh, three and a half. With this degree of mitral regurgitation, you often find that the gradient goes down, in fact, um, with the grasp, and, and that, that's certainly been the case here, so it's 2.2. Um, and this is a better grasp than before, so we certainly have residual mitral regurgitation, no surprise, there's quite a lot of residual prolapse on the lateral side. But we don't have much disease, uh, or lots of disease, but not much mitral regurgitation on the medial side. So what we're going to do next is um, put in a second implant. Um, we're very happy with this grasp. And we're using, as, as always with a second implant, you use quite a lot more fluoroscopy because it's, it's free information that, that means that you can get parallel uh, and on the correct side of the first implant very quickly. Um, so we're planning to put this on the lateral side of the first implant and um, just uh, parallel and pretty close. Just before we do that, we're going to go through the release mechanism. It's a little bit simpler with the precision device, so there's no sutures to cut. You just pull the sutures out. And you may remember with the first generation of the device, um, when you anti-clocked, it tended to spin back on itself. So the, the release cable on this, this iteration of the device, the precision device, um, is uh, ratcheted, so it doesn't spin back on itself as you release. So a bit of fluoro there, just making sure we're not under any leaflet tension, um, and it doesn't look like we are. And just undoing the ratchet. And in just a second, the implant will release. And I'm sure you've seen um, Peter's data on this. Our experience is that residual MR gets better, not worse, after release. But obviously, we're going to check everything. We're going to check the V-wave. We are going to check the systemic pressure and pulmonary veins. So now that we're off, you can see where the residual problem is. There's a little bit of prolapse there that's untreated by the first implant and a clear gap and a clear target for us to aim for. And our plan is to put another implant just parallel and just lateral. So Jim just showing us the tissue bridge. Uh, it looks very nice. Orientation looks good. Uh, you can actually see, if you look at the bottom part of that 3D on fast view, uh, there's some residual prolapse on the, on the posterior mitral valve leaflet. So here we are with the second implant uh, steering down, looking nice and parallel. Uh, just mentioned, if you look at the fluoro there, the first implant is, is moving a little bit. That's not surprising in this kind of degenerative pathology when there's so much redundant tissue. So steering through uh, using both fluoro and 2D imaging to make sure that we're not interacting with the first implant, um, we set our orientation above the valve. And now, now that we're under the valve, we're going to get nice and close to the first implant and nice and parallel. So you can see the first implant on the right of the 3D screen. And the second implant is just canted a little bit towards the first implant. So we just have to anti-clock a tiny bit with precision. Uh, this is more or less one-to-one -one talk. So it's much easier to make fine adjustments. So now we're under the valve. Uh, implant is open. We're in the capture-ready position. Both leaflets, as you'd expect as a second implant, are resting very nicely on the uh, second implant. So anterior class down there. And I'm just talking a little bit posterior just to make, we, make sure we get as much posterior leaflet as we possibly can. Now, as is often the case with second implants, this isn't a difficult grasp. And if we needed to optimize something, it would definitely be worth doing that. Um, so before we close, we're going to have a look in the 3D on fast view and just make sure that we are absolutely parallel, as had been our intention. And so this looks very nice. This is exactly parallel. It's close to the other implant. I suppose the only comment would be there, there was a lot of residual mitral regurgitation. Do we want to be that close? Um, so while we're assessing this grasp, that's something that's going through my mind. Could we perhaps be a millimeter or two lateral of that? So now we are going to close. 
And we're closing on 2D, just watching the leaflets being drawn in. Uh, I find with Pascal, you don't have to give the tension back um, as, as you do with, with Mitral Clip. Um, I, I usually don't do that. You, you do if, if it's very short, very thin leaflets, perhaps, but, but usually I don't. So now we're going to recheck all of our parameters again. So you'll see that the gradient actually is pretty much exactly the same as after the first implant, which is a clue that we've probably done some good on the residual mitral regurgitation. So this is uh, what, what we're left with. So there is very little residual mitral regurgitation. There are a couple of mild jets around both implants. You can see the color into the pulmonary veins is predominantly red, which is a good sign. And actually, you can see that we've now got to systolic dominant pulmonary vein flow, so normal pulmonary vein flow. Important to mention that um, with uh, eccentric jets of mitral regurgitation to check the pulmonary veins on both sides, because you might find that one's normal and one of them is very abnormal. Uh, and that's something we quite commonly find. But in this patient's case, we found a significant improvement in pulmonary vein flow. And you can see as we pan backwards and forwards uh, through the valve, that there's actually very little residual mitral regurgitation and a very nice result. So we're just doing a final 3D check of the tissue bridge, checking that we're still happy that the implants are nice and parallel. So nice double orifice valve there. We've actually constrained all of that uh, the worst of the prolapsing tissue. You can see P1 and P3 are pretty abnormal, um, but there doesn't seem to be a great deal of mitral regurgitation coming through there. And so a 3D color check, you can see very little residual color. And we've checked the gradient is very satisfactory. And on fluoroscopy, uh, there's very little tension in the, in the um, delivery system. So this is our final check of the gradient. And so 2.2 or so, a very, very good result. And so now ready to release. So I just confirmed that the actuation knob is fully clocked. And now releasing suture by suture. So furthest one away first, nothing to cut. So suture coming out very easily. That's the first suture out, and then we'll move on to the second. Uh, important to stabilize the implant handle here. You don't want to unintentionally rotate the implant before you've released it, um, because that puts the leaflets under, under unnecessary tension. So that's the second suture out, and now we're just going to release the uh, cable. So that's just some anti-clockwise turns. Then we're just checking on fluoro from time to time, just making sure there's no residual tension on the system. And in just a second, that implant will be released. And so that's implants off. Uh, very little tension there, as you see. Uh, looks very nice and stable in the 3D view. And we'll just reassess everything once again, just to make sure that there's been no change to the residual color, though it's our experience that that gets better, if anything, after, after implant release. So Jim's just rocking the Echo Pro backwards and forwards, both implants nice and stable, very little residual mitral regurgitation, a lot of residual abnormal tissue, but the worst of the flail is now treated. And the final step as we pull the guide back into the right atrium is just to look at the, the iatrogenic ASD and make sure that the color flow is left to right, which it is. And that brings us to the end. So two implants. And what I would say is uh, it's very easy with recorded cases to lose yes. a lot in the edit. So uh, the edit can be for an extremely long case. Um, I can tell you that the device time for this procedure, which was at the more complex end of the spectrum, the device time was about an hour. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Now we're going to, before we go into the discussion of this case, you have seen now so many good and brilliant cases with MR1 plus or even less. And I want to repeat the initial poll question to you, and I think we can have that up once again. Now, we want to know, does this presentation have changed anything in your understanding, in your clinical um, um, appreciation of the, of the Pascal Precision System? 
<clears throat> so what is right now, after all those presentations, what is your level of confidence in achieving this, this significant unsustained MR reduction with the Pascal system? Is it still very low, low, medium, high, or are now all convinced that this is a very high? And um, we would love to see your response. And uh, during your time, which you take for responding, Maybe we're going to ask you, um, now this is a brilliant case. Um, did you, you initially also plan to do a two device strategy, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think with this kind of pathology, it's extremely unlikely that it was going to be a one device case. I have to say I was quite surprised it was a two device case. Um, this was always going to be going to be quite tricky. Barlow pathology is very, very misleading because the valves often look extremely bad. Um, but I think if you target the worst of the jets, you are not that infrequently pleasantly surprised. So we, we just targeted the worst of the of the flail, and actually everything came together very nicely. You used the A system. Any any idea of, of if the P10 would have performed similarly? What is your personal experience with that? Well, I think there is so much redundant tissue here. You really want to to pull it together and and tighten it up. And I think P10 P10 doesn't do that to the same degree, which is good for the kind of pathology that that I personally treat with P10. You know, if you've got very tethered leaflets and a and an annulus that's really stretched, I don't want to put the leaflets under tension. But in this case, there's so much excess tissue. Uh, to me, ACE ACE is the answer. I think I think this was the right choice here personally. And my final question for you, would you go back also for using the Gen 1 system? Well, I would, but I'd rather use precision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we saw that, and it's just a comment that everything was very precise, and it was quiet, and it was almost lazy. You were always like that on the video. So this is the, the modern cardiology, and I think this, this is uh, everything is done very uh, thoughtful, and then every step was thought through, and it was precise because the technique allowed you um, to put um, um, the devices where you wanted to have it. So congratulations well, is, again. Um, Terrific. Thank you. I mean, the whole thing is so controlled. You know, it's operator and imager, gentle back and forth between them, optimizing the result, and if you don't like it, you can move it. So you are, I think, let's see. Yeah, let's see. Do we have an answer already? Oh, we only have ah. 17 <laughs> votes. Uh, so oh. we increased a little bit from medium to high. We not, didn't reach the very high. Well, with that, I would thank you all. I would thank Sam, Miriam, and all the all all uh, participants on, on, the, on the side here. Wolfgang, this was a great session. I think we learned a lot. We learned that the precision system is really more precise in our possibilities to really steer down into the mitral valve to place the devices where we want to go to and to get really great results. Um, this MR1 plus rate of, of high 80s or 90s is something really we would need to look for in the future. And with that, I think um, we will also improve our patient outcomes. I thank you all for coming. Um, have a nice evening and uh, enjoy another last day tomorrow here in London. Thank you.